Thanks very much for having me here today. Um, I'll be honest, I was elected mayor this past fall and I was sworn in December 7th. And I'm relatively new to this issue, so I've been learning quite a bit about it very quickly and I am quickly becoming a supporter. If you don't know uh, Councillor John Hink on the Portland City Council, he is really your hero on this issue. He's been working on it for years. <laughs> Councillor Hink, if you wouldn't mind standing up. Do you want to stand up and say hi? <laughs> anyway, thank you. Um, he and I uh, really, he, he has been working very hard on this issue, but he and I have been talking about what can we do to make sure that the Portland City Council uh, at a minimum takes a vote on this issue this year before the fall election to get the council on record on where it is we want to go and hopefully um, we can pass something that has some real teeth. We were excited by what occurred in South Portland and the progress that they're making, the studying that they did. They really took their time, it appears, to get this, uh, move this ball forward. We're taking a serious look at that to see if we can model something similar for the city of Portland if you don't know, we, we, are, uh, we do a lot of very good progressive environmental work here, banning styrofoam, putting a fee on plastic bags. We're one of the strongest communities around recycling. Uh, but this is an area we have not been able to get over that hump. And um, I think these groups that come in and try to beat you down, uh, they're, they're somewhat effective in the city. But hopefully we have the energy this year to try to get something serious on the table. And uh, I truly am hopeful that we can get something done before the fall election so that this becomes part of the conversation as we debate this issue going forward. So I really want to welcome you here today. I know that uh, Congresswoman Pingree is, is she here? Yes, there she is. Um, I actually was looking up before. Um, she has been a real leader, as you know, on organic farming and um, certainly around pesticide issues. And when the White House came out with their plan around pollinators, which she, of course, supported, she also said at the time, one missing link in this strategy is the effect of pesticides and herbicides. She was really pushing this issue, I think, at a time when a lot of people were thinking, we, perhaps we've done enough, as we were watching our bees and monarch butterflies and disappear. She was putting out that clarion call from a national level that we have to start looking at this locally. And, so I'm really proud that she's here and that I'm going to be able to hear her speak this afternoon. So anyway, thank you for having this forum in the city of Portland. And uh, I look forward to your work. And please stay active with us. There's nothing more important than your coming to the city council and making your voices very clear. Thank you. Not a, Portland, not a Portland resident, but as a mayor, thanking the mayor for his commitment to uh, supporting the legislation. I think it's a uh, great piece of work. My name is Ted Quade. I'm the executive director of the Maine Organic Farmers and Gardeners Association, most often referred to as MOFCA. And uh, I think Heather Spaulding, our deputy director, has been the emissary to Beyond Pesticides. Heather, I want to congratulate you for your award Yesterday, a dragonfly award? Great, it's such a good thing. I really appreciate the support you've given. <laughs> Heather and I have been so busy running here and there and everywhere, we haven't had a chance to talk in quite a few days, so I'm really catching up with her right here at the podium. So, um, I also want to thank Jay Feldman and his team at Beyond Pesticides for all of their great work, not only here, but all over the country continuously. And I know that Portland and Maine are so pleased to be hosting this annual gathering of folks working for a cleaner, pesticide-free environment. MOFCA is particularly pleased to be here with you today. Uh, MOFCA and Beyond Pesticides, Heather probably covered this yesterday, but I'll cover it again today. We work together. Uh, with other organizations as partners in a group called the National Organic Coalition. We share values, we share campaigns, and we share the conviction that a healthful future must include a roadmap for restricting or eliminating the toxins that daily threaten our food and our families. We believe organic agriculture plays a key role in a more healthful future. So it is good to be here among friends, and one friend whom we are all fortunate to have among us 
is Congresswoman Shelley Pingree. She's a Maine Democrat with a long and distinguished record as a certified organic family farmer, an environmentalist, a small business person, and as well, a state and federal legislator. She is, as some might put it, the real deal. So let's take a moment to take a little tour of Shelley's farm. I've been working on agricultural policy first in the state legislature, even in the 90s, taking on issues of GMOs and bovine growth hormone and things that were starting to concern people. And now, you know, many years later, being in Congress and seeing the enormous interest that there is on the part of the American public and consumers who say, I want healthy food. I want to meet the cow that, you know, that delivers the milk. I want to, I want to know what's going on with our food, and I want healthy food policies, and I want to support much more local food and uh, the farmers in my own community. This farm that we own now is called the Turner Farm, and this family was one of the earliest farm families to come to the island of North Haven. They came from Massachusetts, literally brought their own house on a barge in the 1700s. I first came here when I was a teenager. We started out in a little cabin at the end of the road and grew some of our own food, made a lot of mistakes along the way. There were so many people here who remembered you know, coming up to the farm and buying a glass bottle of milk that, you know, we had no trouble selling everything we raised. And there are a lot of older people who just were so excited, like, you know, the taste of the milk, like, oh, this is just what I remember. We love milking cows, dairy goats, we raise chickens, pork, beef, several acres of vegetables, and some of them under greenhouses. It's not an easy thing to do. You have to find a way to sort of develop a niche. We're lucky enough to run a restaurant, so we have a great market of growing the food here, taking it right over to a restaurant. People feel so much more confident about the quality of the food that they eat, if they can visit the local farm, ask the farmer how it's grown. You know, they don't have to read everything on the label. They can look the person right in the eye and say, you know, do you use chemical fertilizers? Do you use this kind of hormone when you're growing my chickens? When a person is able to go into their local store or stop by a farm stand or join a CSA, they know that money is going right back into the local community. It's helping that farmer, it's helping that farmer to keep that land in farming, so it's good environmentally. It's helping whoever works on that farm and has a job working there or helps to process the food. And it makes it possible for that store to attract more customers because they're saying, hey, we have these tomatoes and corn and goat cheese that was all grown locally. Um, those are jobs. There's all kinds of opportunities in rural America today. And this sort of rapid growth in the interest in local food and farming has really really helped bring that rural economy back to life. Really, really, I feel like we should just call uh, uh, Shelley up here right now, but I, there's a couple more things I want to add uh, to the uh, conversation. The Congresswoman has a strong history of political involvement at the local and state level. And finally, in 2008, she was elected to the U.S. House. In Congress, Shelley wrote the Local Farms, Foods, and Jobs Act, a comprehensive package of farm policy reforms, expanding uh, opportunities for local and regional farmers, and intended to give consumers better access to healthy food. Many of the provisions in that bill uh, found their way into the final version of the most recent farm bill, which I think is about two years old at this point. Hard to tell sometimes with the way Congress works. Um, uh, so I'm sure that by now it is clear that Shelley Pingree is a two, true friend to our movement. So we salute her commitment and welcome her to the 34th National Pesticide Forum to hear her views. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ted. Thank you all for being here today. I didn't know you were going to have to watch a political ad before I would come up. But, um, glad you got a chance to see a little bit of Maine. I'm going to apologize in advance. As you can tell, I'm a, I'm a little bit under the weather. But I just did not want to miss the opportunity to uh, welcome all of you to the state of Maine. We're thrilled that you have chosen to come here for your conference and to have so many like-minded people here in our wonderful state. So uh, if I start to lose my voice, don't worry, I'll just quit talking and you won't have to listen to a long political speech. But I'm very happy to have you all here. Um, I appreciate Ted and thank him very much for his kind remarks. And I uh, really appreciate the work that he and everyone here from MOFCA 
does. Um, they have been an incredible part of uh, the important rich organic history we have here in Maine, and I think um, Maine Organic Farmers and Gardeners has done more to help influence national policy than any other locally based group. So we're just very lucky, and they've been a very important part of my history as well. So I'm happy to be here with them. Mayor Strimling, I forgot where you are in the room, but, and uh, Councillor Hank. Um, it's great to have our new mayor here today, and, and good to hear you. Um, endorsing the propaganda, because, you know, Portland's going to be the next city um, that needs to turn around here. And I'm, I'm confident that this is the kind of city that would like to make some changes like this and, and follow in the footsteps of Ogunquit, Maine. So um, both I'm proud to represent. And to the city council, uh, no, you're the um, county council chair of Montgomery County, yeah, or president of Montgomery. Well, that was, I, I only heard the last of your presentation, but good for you. Great, great guts and fortitude. And I know that close to the beltway, some of the 1,200 lobbyists that come to see us every day are right there in your territory. So that was a gutsy fight and very impressive. And you're right, those are the examples that give us all the opportunities to, to move forward on some of these issues. Um, just again, welcome to Portland. I hope you've, uh, I'm sure some of you have been here before and many of you may be from Portland, but we're just such a wonderful city that's got this great vibrancy of a working waterfront, but also um, we're so attached to food, uh, whether it's the fish we harvest or the farm products and uh, have really been a great, um, seen a lot of great growth around the farm to table movement and people really interested in eating locally grown foods and organically grown foods and that's just I think been great. We also of course have wonderful local breweries like so many other states they're growing at a fast rate and it's a very similar kind of interest that people have and today I think Allagash, one of our biggest breweries, is introducing a beer that's wholly made from main ingredients. So we now are growing hops, malt, and uh, I forget what else is in there from Maine, but those are those are key changes and important returns because both of those crops hadn't been grown here, or at least um, hops for a long time. Anyway, I got to get to saying a few things, but I just wanted to also uh, say how proud I am to be in the room with Jim Garrettson. I know there's so many other great speakers, but he's just been doing such great work for a long time, and Heather from Mafka, and anyway, I, I better stop because I can't see everyone out there, but really we have a lot of people to be proud of in Maine, and I'm glad you got a chance to see um, Stacy and John's farm yesterday, I realized there's a little bit of their footage in there, so, uh, you know, it's good. Um, anyway, um, I first came to Maine in 1971, and uh, I, I was one of those uh, many people who came to Maine with the Back to the Land movement. I had read Living the Good Life by Helen and Scott Nearing, and I was very interested in this idea of sustainable farming. I was fresh out of high school. Even though I came from a dairy farming family, uh, it belonged to my grandparents and then my uncle, and I'd only really visited on the weekends. So I, I had this sense, like a city kid, that there must be something um, interesting about it. But farming, uh, where I grew up, I was from Minnesota, was just seemed like a completely different world. And I was very, very interested in this idea of what it would be like to be a backlander. And you see, uh, I still live in the same island that I came to almost 45 years ago. It's 12 miles offshore, about 90 miles north of here. Um, and only 400 people year-round. So it was living in an isolated community and attempting to be a back-to-the-lander with not too many actual skills besides this handy book from Helen Scott Nearing and the Whole Earth Catalog and a few other things. Luckily, somewhere along the way, I made the um, fortuitous decision to start studying um, at College of the Atlantic in Bar Harbor, which still is a wonderful college, and at the time, Elliot Coleman was a teacher, so, you know, the rest is history. I learned from one of the best organic farmers still in the country and one of the most knowledgeable people on the importance of soil to our system of, of, of soil health, and certainly one of the people who proves over and over again with healthy soil, you have healthy plants, and many of these questions about pesticides are just, um, they're not important. They don't, they don't belong there, and so much of what we've destroyed in our system is understanding the full ecology of the process and the importance of diversity on a farm. And um, this is not a room where I have to explain any of that to any of you or argue it with any of you. But um, it's, it's, it seems so simple when you're doing it. And it seems so simple when you see the many successful farms. Um, but it is so difficult now to get ourselves back to that system. Um, 
much of the work that I've been doing since I've gotten to Congress, I guess fast forward there a little bit, I, I was a back to lander for a long time. We had a wonderful farm. I started out um, with three milking cows and 100 chickens and a couple acres of vegetables selling in the summer. And uh, somewhere along the way, I ended up uh, deciding to become a state legislator in Maine. So in the 90s, I got elected to the state legislature when my children were in their mid-teens. And I did get a chance to serve on the Agriculture Committee, so I got a little flavor for what it's like to actually do some of the work of farming and understand how the systems work. And then begin to come up against um, the challenges that were, people were facing. And even in the 90s, um, the idea of discussing anything like um, GMO labeling or um, uh, being opposed to bovine growth hormone or many of the things that we're taking on were, were such marginalized issues and maybe people would occasionally humor you on the floor of the house and let you talk about it. But pretty much it was something that nobody thought you'd have any chance to ever change. And for most of the 40 years I've been an organic farmer, most of the first, at least 25 of them, people just treated it like something, well, that's nice, but you know that'll never feed the country and no one will ever be interested in it that much. It's just for a... Um, a, a certain segment. So fast forward, I, I now, these many years later, get a chance to serve in Congress. This is my eighth year, and I am on, I've been on the Agriculture Committee, and I'm on the Agricultural Appropriations Committee now, so that's exactly where I wanted to be. It's a wonderful um, opportunity because the um, Appropriations Committee, of course, writes the budget of all departments and oversees them, and um, most of the time, uh, policy is developed and really made, in a sense, by how we spend our money. So, well, not everything, well, not much is going right right now, but I'm still very grateful to be in a place where I can um, take on these issues every day and use the expertise that I've learned um, as a farmer, knowing so many farmers in a state where we have so much um, engaging work going on, and also for the many years of working with activists like all of you. Um, a few of the things that I've done, and I, I really know you're, you're just such a knowledgeable group that I don't want to um, you know, wear you down with facts and statistics, but of course we've taken a great interest in the plight of the monarch. Um, I think this is a room full of people who know how um, damaging glyphosate has been and how difficult it is to, to reverse that. Um, you probably know these facts, but in 2006, there were about 300 million monarchs from North America mi migrating to Mexico. And uh, as recently as 2012, that dropped to 60 million, and last year it was about half that, 30 million. So I feel like we're on this trajectory, which um, we soon may not see monarchs anymore. And we've taken an interest in that, obviously, because it's such an important indicator species, but. Um, I just tell people about it and they say, no, no, you're kidding, M monarch, butterfly? I mean, everybody brought a monarch, you know, the chrysalis in to watch it hatch in their fourth grade class. I mean, that was just something you saw everywhere. And in my community on our island, there's, there's always been monarchs everywhere. And it wasn't until, really, until I started researching and understanding this in Congress, I started looking around saying, you know, you really don't see it much anymore. And they're gone, and of course that's important because it's such an indicator of the fact that their habitat um, has been destroyed, that we've got you know, some states like Ohio that don't have any milkweed left in them anymore, and there's so few, um, there's so few uh, uh, you know, feeding grounds for them anymore because of what we've done with herbicides. And I think all of you know that a lot of that is related to the use of um, Roundup glyphosate and um, as an herbicide, and it's done because of GMO related plants um, that are round up ready, as they say. So um, we've done a few things. We, we um, had about 50 of our House colleagues um, send a letter to President Obama about protecting the butterfly, um, securing more habitat of milkweed, um, started an online petition about the, with the EPA. That, that's gotten over 200,000 signatures so far. So we know it's an issue that people care deeply about. There's a certain amount of responsiveness, and I don't want to be at all dismissive of it, because I do appreciate that the USDA has launched a monarch initiative to help protect their habitats. We're just, we're, on Tuesday, we'll go back and finish 
some of our work on the agriculture appropriations bill, and we put in language um, further encouraging the USDA to do more weak work restoring the monarch habitat. But in the end, I think we all know it's the overuse of these existing herbicides. It's the way our system is designed. And um, it's so structural and obviously um, so heavily lobbied from the other side. Uh, we have, um, I think, 1,200 lobbyists on the Hill who work in food and agriculture related causes. Over $350 million is spent to lobby Congress. And just to put it in perspective, that's more than is spent on the defense industry. So um, when you think of sort of big money on the Hill, um, that's, that's a big place of where it is from food processing to so many of these um, issues. We, um, of course, are also been very concerned about pollinators and um, have been working hard with many of our colleagues. And I see, I noticed in your newsletter that you, um, you mentioned um, this most recent letter by um, Earl Blumenau and Peter DeFazio on an EPA review of glyphosate. Oh, that was back on glyphosate, yeah, but anyway, but those guys um, are good colleagues of mine. Um, even though they're from the other Portland, and I never let them forget that we were the first Portland. In case nobody ever told you this, the other Portland got its name because they couldn't decide if they should be named Boston or Portland, and they flipped a coin. <laughs> Look at that. What if we'd been going to Boston, Oregon all this time? Uh, I could tell you the most important thing is a lot of Mainers wouldn't lose their luggage. Anyway, um, uh, once again, I don't have to explain to any of this room, money in this room, about the crisis around bees and, and all fingers point to neonicotinoids. We recently had a chemical company come into our office who said not to worry. As you know, they all want to point the finger at a, a, a mite, a little mite that infects them, and they said, it's okay. This isn't, this isn't anything to do with chemicals in spite of how many times they've been told that. Um, it's this mite, and we were developing a new chemical to deal with the mite. And unfortunately, you know, not everybody laughs at that. They, a lot of times people say, oh, good, good, you know, because that's kind of how you feel, you know. You get a bad cold and you take something for it and that has a bad impact on something else and then they say, oh, that's okay, we got a medicine for that. And then you take a medicine for that and before you know it, it's a whole chain. And it works well if you're in the business of producing those kinds of things. And I appreciate that we, we need to, you know, have people who produce a lot of things. But in the end, um, this is nowhere near going to solve our problem. Uh, there's a recent report on the, from the GAO um, reporting on some of the progress that the USD and EPA, who have both made this high levels of concern, reporting um, about how they're addressing those threats. And frankly, they said, one, the two departments don't work well enough together. Uh, this just recently came out, and we were discussing it with the EPA. And secondly, they said, um, you know, the EPA just truly is not looking at the effects of multiple pesticides on bees. And that's one of the biggest problems I think we continue to face, is that every department has its restrictions, and every lawyer knows exactly what the boundaries of those restrictions are. So maybe you can look at plant health or human health or a certain kind of environmental health in the river, but you're never really allowed um, to have this overall look about the um, environmental infrastructure of our country or the ecology of what's going on. And as we know, many of these things have gone way beyond just the first question of the impact on human health. It might be perfectly um, fine for you to have an encounter with a certain kind of chemical, but in fact, if it's having a different kind of impact on a bee or a monarch butterfly or anything else, um, it's going to have a different kind of damage to our system overall. And frankly, we know most of these things um, have a serious impact on human health. It just takes us a little longer to prove it. So um, I, I do want to recognize, I don't know if Jonathan Lundgren is here, here today, but um, we've brought him up recently. I know he was speaking this morning, and, and um, it's really important to have those whistleblowers. We, brought him up in our most recent hearing with the 
um, Office of the Inspector General, and I know they've just told me, and I think it's public, that they're about to launch their audit into the USDA's scientific integrity policy because... Um, Um, I think we know that's critically important. And uh, the government works a little bit slowly, so we probably won't see a report until next year, but I'm going to make this one of my top priorities, is doing a little more digging into how our government agencies um, may not be always um, providing us with the most balance of scientific information. And I think we all know how critical that is because all too often now, universities are struggling with uh, balancing their budgets, and you know we have to have somebody overseeing who pays for the study that's done at so many universities to figure out if it's factual information. And um, I think the questions that have been raised by Jonathan Lundgren and others about the USDA just makes us um, want to be sure that we're, we're checking all the time to make sure the scientific integrity policy is there. It's tough enough at times for um, our, our executive branch departments to deal with Congress. Um, you may have heard that there's a particular um, uh, lack of interest in science right now in Congress. Um, you could even say there was a little bit of a denial going on about things like global warming. And um, I know I read in a recent um, story in the Washington Post, it was actually one of the ones about Jonathan Lundgren about a, another USDA scientist who was testifying in front of the Ag Committee. I wasn't there um, that day. Um, and um, he was asked some questions related to the mite in bees and, and the effect of pesticides. And he, he wandered a little bit into the topic of how even if we eradicated the mite, the pesticide might have a long-term effect. And uh, according to the story, he was told um, at the end of the hearing by one of the members that um, he had gone off script, uh, which uh, unfortunately that kind of um, at least confining of what departments are allowed to say, um, I don't think ever comes from the executive branch directly, but happens and certainly happens when members of Congress don't want to hear, are told something they don't want to hear. So um, just, just to put some positive light on this, I mean, so much of what we try to work on is how the EPA and USDA and our complex system um, is better designed to restrict the things that we know we shouldn't be using. But I will say um, the most positive change and positive development I've seen um, since I first started 45 years ago is this tremendous interest in the part of the public. And your story of Montgomery County was just another great example of you know, a handful of moms or a group of activists or some people who've suffered through an illness or a, a challenge who get out the other side and say, wait, I gotta, I'm going to fix this thing. And in the end, it's, it's really led to a sea change, I believe, in people's interest in eating organic food. And, and organic food, and I... And the first one to say it's critically important, thank you, Mafka and others, who keep this organic standard strict. And it's always tricky on the edges, so I, I know that can be a problem. But the fact is, to, today, we have a very good organic standard in our country, for the most part. And it allows people to say, if I pick something off the shelf that says organic, there's not going to be pesticides and chemicals in this food, and I can trust what I'm eating. And that has become increasingly important. Um, as you know, uh, organic sales are, are really going through the roof. From 2008 to 2014, the sales of organic products grew by over 70%. Um, and, and that's huge. And, and I, in the retail sector today, you know, every everybody wants to have a, a section for locally grown and organic food. And we're excited um, from what we see in Maine that people are also very attracted to locally grown, um, particularly because a lot of food travels, you know, 7 to 14 days before it gets to you. So that in itself is an inhibitor. We don't we don't want to encourage um, growing all of our organic food in one part of the country and then having to transport it. It's just yet another polluter. Um, and also, it's just been so great for the local economy of states like ours, where we've really seen this huge resurgence 
in um, people being able to go back and make a living on a farm or start a farm. We're one of the few states where the average age of our farmers is starting to go down. We have more land under cultivation. Uh, we have a tremendous number of women farmers, one of the highest percentages in the country, because women are excellent innovators and hard workers. Um, but also, it's just, um, it, you know, it, it's, it's right for all the right reasons. We know it's right. It's, it's not only healthier for people and less toxic for our environment, but in an era where we're desperately worried about global warming, putting more organic matter in our soil, um, farming more uh, responsibly. Uh, organic matter is a tremendous sequester of carbon, and we could change a lot of the problems that we have now if we just had more soil and more organic matter in our soil. So it's right for every possible reason. And even better, at the end, most of the time, the organic farmer gets a better price. So it's better for the farmer, too. It's better for the farm worker who doesn't have to handle toxic chemicals. So I, I'm excited about this huge growth. Um, I know sometimes people cringe when I tell them that Walmart wants to be the largest retailer of organic food in the country. Um, and I don't want Walmart to be our largest retailer of organic food in the country. I'm just excited that they see that there is a market out there and that they know if they want to sell to consumers today of whatever income level, if they can't supply them products that that consumer can trust, they won't shop there anymore. And when they're starting to worry about that, you know every consumer product company right now is worrying about that. Nine out of 10 women who choose to buy baby food buy organic. That's a staggering statistic because that is, you know, every working mom in the country, that's everybody who's too busy, whether they have money enough or not, they're saying, I want to put organic food in my baby. I want to make sure this kid is going to grow up white. And I'm worried about all those other things. So in many ways, that is the best possible pressure we've got going. I mean, we can try to regulate, and they can try to litigate, and we can try, you know, and those things you know, those wars go on ever and ever and ever. But when the consumer says, hey, I, I don't want this stuff anymore. I want this other stuff, and I don't want, you know, I don't want your chemicals on it. Well, then now what, you have what you have now, which is every major commodity company scrambling to find sources for organic corn and organic wheat and organic potatoes and organic dairies. We've seen um, exciting growth in our dairy industry in Maine, which many people had written off years ago, but that's because now there are dairy uh, companies here in competition driving to pick up milk in places they never would go before, but they need the supply. So it's a, it's a really great turnaround. and. I, I, my biggest concern is that we don't get ahead of it, and then we find all these companies could only find the source that they needed in China or somewhere in Africa or somewhere in South America, and I want every other country to thrive, but I don't want to have to worry about whether the Chinese organic corn is meeting the standards that we have in our country or whether we have even enough inspectors to inspect it on the way in, which I guarantee you now we don't. So um, I think there are some huge opportunities here. And I think that will have an enormous impact, what's going on with consumers. And I think every time a group of moms, I worked with a group of moms when we were trying to um, force the EUSDA to restrict the use of hamburger with pink slime in school lunches. And I'll tell you, those guys, they scared the crap out of people. It was great. And um, you're not going to see any pink slime in anyone's hamburgers. School lunch, and in fact, not much of it's being manufactured right now. So that's, that's a very good thing. Um, so let me just wrap this up with saying I appreciate deeply all that all of you are doing. And from my side, we're going to continue our work on everything we can do to raise awareness and um, restrict the use of these chemicals that we know are very dangerous, and we already have a lot of scientific evidence to prove that. We're also putting a lot of effort into trying to beef up those places at the USDA where we can be of assistance to the farmers who have enormous opportunity. I, I think this would be a dereliction of duty, and it already is a little bit, if our biggest agency in charge of assisting farmers, supporting farmers, isn't investing your tax dollars and making sure that all these new opportunities can be realized. We asked them last year to come back to us and say, um, 
how much money of a fairly large uh, research budget is being spent on organic. And, and we've, we've worked to enhance their budget. We've gotten more money in it. But last year when they came back and told us, actually, even after the increases, how much was going to organic c considerations? And there's a million things we can research now with new technology and better ideas for farmers and weed control and soil health. And there's just so much that needs to be done. Um, less than 1% of all USDA money is spent on researching regarding organic. So um, from my side, I think one of the most important jobs we can do is uh, having an impact on things like that, which at their core really affect the infrastructure on what our farmers have to work with and, and are a really important support system, as well as many of the programs there that we've tried to encourage. Um, things like farmers market promotion programs, making it easier for low-income people to access healthy foods, but also um, value-added producer grants, making it easier for young farmers to buy a farm, many of the impediments that get in the way, because I do think we've got a public anxious to eat healthier food, farmers who'd like to be growing it and making money doing so, um, and we just have to make sure all that comes together. So I'm, uh, I'm going to just end by telling you I'm hopeful and tell you how much I appreciate all of you coming here and doing the activist and scientific and other work that you do and hope that all of you who have visited Maine for the first time come back when um, it's summer and you can eat even more of our abundant fish and lobsters and food. And uh, again, thank you for the privilege of having me come and address you today.